is a state of the body. Wellness is a state of being. Weight loss, calorie counting, crash diets, snapback are some of the buzzwords in today's fast growing fit fam industry. But is that all that is required in our search for obtaining the best quality of life? It is my pleasure to welcome you to another episode of Chapters. And on today's episode, we seek to understand healthy living and wellness from a holistic point of view. To join me in this discussion is my very special guest, Dr. Oluwa Toyin Bodiabas. She is an integrative health and wellness consultant, married with a beautiful son. Now, she's also the author of two amazing books. The first is Range, where she tells her personal story. And the second, through which we have the, today's discussion, is titled Wellness Found Me. Dr. Toyin. You are welcome to Chapters. Thank you for having me. I came, I, you know, I, I always try to say how I came across these books, but I think yours stumbled in my house or in my hands <laughs> one way or the other. But before we start, you, you are a medical doctor, so your doctor is medical doctor. Yes. But your field, your first field wasn't wellness and all that. In fact, I was determined to do pediatry and all of that. So what led you into this journey of wellness and healthy living? Hmm. Um, you know how you have a problem and in trying to find the help that you need and then you get to the point where you realize that you don't have help that is tailor made for your particular situation and so it was in my bid to help myself that wellness found me so um in trying to have a child we had gone, we waited for almost 8, eight years. years and so we started fertility treatment so i'd been taking pills taking injections and then um about 7 years into marriage we then had our first ivf procedure and it was in the middle of IVF procedure, taking injections and everything. My gynecologist said my blood pressure kept climbing up and um, he didn't know why. You know, so he suggested I saw a cardiologist and um, we went to my husband's practice at the time to see the cardiologist there. He got me to do a series of tests, full comprehensive screening. There was nothing to be found. Apart from the fact that my parents are hypertensive, there was, my tests were clean. So it took my fourth visit to the cardiologist for me to say, you know what, I'm in the middle of an IVF cycle. And he says, oh, you should have said that to me from the start, yes. that the hormonal injections I was taking um, could account for the blood pressure that was climbing up. Not everybody would have that problem, but for some mm. people, yes. People and then react to it differently. Differently, exactly. And then with hormones, the fact that they have very long half-life, which is um, they're in your system like for years, you know, so they can still be perpetrating their effect even after you've stopped using the hormones, mm -hmm. yes. So I had to start um, blood pressure medication in the middle of the IVF cycle, and this was in 2010. And um, it got to a point where we did a second IVF, then we had the baby, and then I realized that, okay, it's been three years and I'm still taking blood pressure medicine. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I didn't want that um, to be a lifetime. lifetime. Yes. yes, I didn't want to take medication for, for a lifetime. So I, I started to look for help, you know. I thought, okay, first I needed to get rid of the excess weight. The funny, I didn't gain weight pregnant, but as soon as I stopped nursing, I just started to bag on some weight. I gained weight during the IVF procedure. Okay. okay, so before you go on, let's just lay background before that. So you were not, you grew up, like you said, slim, almost skinny. Skinny, actually. <laughs> and the weight didn't start, so from when you grew up to when you were married, you were absolutely skinny. No. Okay. Okay, um, for the most part in university, I was 45 kilo with this height. So I remember my husband, then oh, he was my boyfriend. 
he will then um, tease me that we need to put coins in my pocket so that the wind <laughs> doesn't sort of blow me away, you know. I gained a bit of weight just before I finished medical school, but um, I mean, gaining weight to then become a size eight, really, it's not like a hair. Yes, but you didn't gain weight, you, you know, just but, well, added yes, some flesh. <laughs> I think I just gained weight to become, to look healthy, really, you know, and then um, everything started just before we got married, because that's when I had, I had my first surgery. And shortly after that, they then started to give me pills and injections mm. and stuff. And that led to the mm. expansion, so um, to speak. Yeah. <laughs> and that led to the whole change of life. And then the drugs started coming and yes. then the hormonal changes and then the blood pressure. So when you then realized you didn't want to take these drugs for a lifetime. Okay, this was um, somewhere in 2013. I'd stopped nursing. I nursed for 14 months. So when I stopped, I then realized, okay, at least I'd, I'd gotten over that responsibility. It was time to take care of myself and start to, you know, do something about blood pressure. So I um, went back to my cardiologist and it was still the same thing, you know, pills, pills. And then of course, when I was pregnant, they had to change the pills so that it had to be something that wouldn't affect the baby. Mm. So the same thing when I was nursing. When I stopped that, they had to switch me to another pill and all of that. And it just, it didn't bode well for me. I just mm. thought this is not the life that I signed up for, you know. And I was in my late 30s and then thinking about it, like, okay, I still have what, maybe another 50 years to live. Why would I want to take blood pressure Pills, medication? Yes. Yeah, you know. So in my quest to actually find help, and I realized that there was nobody that could offer me the help that I wanted. Mm. I started to look for help for myself. And here we are today. And which is interesting. So I wanted us to first debunk the myth mm -hmm. that slimness is fitness before we even go to wellness. Absolutely not. Because um, my husband stands at 6'1". He's probably the skinniest thing that you've ever seen. And um, he will go up a flight of stairs and will be panting. <laughs> you know, I can run, I can do all of those things. But he's not. Um, he's slim, but... Definitely nowhere near fit. Sorry, Dal, but I had to take that in. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure he will forgive you. <laughs> He's used to it, actually. <laughs> so so you, are, you are fitter than he is, oh, absolutely. even if he is. Absolutely. Than, than a lot of people. Because, I mean, I, I do weight training. I walk, I cycle, I swim, all of that. So, so a lot of people watching this are thinking, okay, I, like I said, we are now in the stage where everybody is going to healthy eating, eat this, don't eat this, count this, don't count this. What really is this healthy lifestyle we are talking about? Health has um, a different look for different people. Now, it depends also on what stage you are at in your life. You know, for me, at the time where I was looking for a baby, I wasn't concerned about what effects that the drugs were having and all of that. Yeah. But then you come to a place when you realize that you want to be around long enough for the people who need you, for mm. the people who love you. And that was my motivating force, so to speak. Because then I have this little human who couldn't do anything for himself. Mm. And I'm thinking to myself, I want to be there when he finishes university. university. I want to be there when he's getting married. And so it got to that point where I decided, you know what, let's do something about it. So for, for people, it has, you have to come to the realization that you're actually seeking to be healthy you know, by yourself. Because what I've realized in consulting is when patients come to me and we sit down, we're having a, a, a conversation, once they're not ready mentally, there's mm. nothing that you can do. So there has to be a shift in the core. You know, you have to be in that place where by yourself, for, for yourself, you've come to the realization that I need to do something. So, which is why you can see that there's a lot of obese people and you're wondering, okay, aren't doctors doing anything yeah. for them? You know, there's, it's not so much of doctors doing things for you or saying things for you to do. If you're not ready by yourself, there's not a lot that you can do about it. So for each individual, you have to get to that place where you determine that, you know what, this is, is too bad, I need to do something. So everybody needs to find that break point. For everybody, it's until, it's like learning a new habit. Mm. So you have to be in that frame of mind to be able to say, okay, this is what I want to do. For any goal at all that you want to achieve, you have to be ready mentally. So for as long as you're not ready mentally, at any roadblock, you quit. You know, so it has to come first from the person and they need to be mentally ready. And I think another key factor is letting your loved ones know that this is what you want to do so they can support. Because you have family members who are enablers, you know, like my husband would come with ice cream and say, you know what, let's, you know, so. <laughs> your husband would say, why is she doing this to me? Maybe he'll change, you know, <laughs> he, he would. But that's because for him, and like you said in the book, when you were slim, 
you could eat anything and it wasn't showing on your body. It was ignorance, really. You hmm. know, it was from a place of ignorance where, you know, growing up, I wasn't exposed to, okay, you need to eat healthy, you need to exercise. I didn't see my parents do any of those things, you know. So it wasn't something I was used to. And then you get to medical school and our, our curriculum is sort of funny. You're learning clinical things separate from when you're learning things like anatomy and stuff. So you were not even harnessing everything. It wasn't coming together. So it, it took getting to my clinical year to then begin to see the relationship be between health and exercise, health and diet for real, you know, because you've learned something theoretically. Then you're not seeing people suffering and you're borrowing the knowledge from, okay, this is what is going on physiologically mm. and this is what can help. Hmm. You know, so it took getting to that place for me to begin to understand I needed to look after my body and look after myself. Wow. Okay, we need to go on a short break now, but when we come back, we're now really going to your journey and how you help us to break down the steps that you took to this journey of wellness and a healthy lifestyle. Thanks. So we'll go on a short break now, and when we come back, we'll continue this conversation. <laughs> You're welcome back to Chapters and on today's show we are talking about healthy living, healthy lifestyle and really seeking to understand what it is and still with me is Dr. Oluwa Toyin Body Abbas and so before we went on the break you give us a foundation as to your journey into healthy living but I want to read something from your book and like you said you had grown up slim skinny, the weight started to pile on and then because of the drugs you were taking then the weight piled on. And one of the things you said here is we must learn to accept our bodies as they are now while working to get healthy and fit. We must have grace and compassion for ourselves through the process. And why I like this is sometimes people enter the process really just disliking who they are. Mm -hmm. How do you learn to accept something that you know is not good, but you have to first get to the point of that place of acceptance? And how did that work for you? Okay, um, a lot of it has to do with emotional health. Because if you're in that place where you're body shaming, you don't accept mm -hmm. the way that you look and everything, one, your, your motivation to even want to do anything is wrong because then it's focused more on your appearance as opposed mm. to your health. Mm. Mm. Sorry, focus more on your appearance Parents. as opposed to your health. I call it the lookist attitude, where mm. you get to that place where, okay, it's all about how you look. Mm. You're not even bothered at, about um, whether you're healthy or not. So mm. it's like a vanity I thing. I just want to be... Exactly. Okay, it's about how I look, mm. when I step out and all of that, as opposed to how healthy are you. That reminds me, so you can actually achieve that, quote unquote, how I look without being healthy. Because you then said in your book, there was a time where you went on a certain diet mm -hmm. and you had done drastic measures and people there saying, were you ill? My goodness. <laughs> Were you, you know, sick and it you was, lost um, 10 kg? I, I, look, I look at pictures from that period and I'm like, why? How? You know, it was um, a raw fruits and vegetables diet which a lot of people do now which a lot of people do now ideally there's nothing wrong with that if you do it short bursts at a time so because it's for detoxing so, you know to, to detoxify your system and all of that so when you want to detox yes it's fine so maybe three days max one week but i went on that diet for 30 days <laughs> you know not eating anything that was cooked so vegetables Ooh. were eating raw fruits and everything and all of that and i did lose weight but let me clarify here because for a lot of people who go on pills fat diets and everything when you actually get on the scale, it tips in your favor. So you look like, okay, yes, I've lost weight. Mm. But when you're losing weight doing all those things, you're actually losing your muscles, your lean tissue. So you're losing muscles and you're losing body water, not yeah. fat. Because the, the only water, water and, and, muscles. and muscles, yes. Which so you that's need. What, yes, absolutely. Because um, what then happens is you get on the scale and you feel like you're lighter and you're, you're feeling like, okay, but... Once you stop the diet, there's a rebound weight gain hmm. because you haven't conditioned your mind to eat healthy and to exercise. And really, the way to burn fat is to exercise because when you start to exercise, then you build up muscles and muscles is actually what burns fat. Okay, so there's this, well, maybe there's understanding or general body of knowledge that the first thing to do when you want to lose weight is first crash diet. So stop eating or change the eating, then the eggs. That what really makes the body go down <laughs> first is no food or, you know, cut off carbs, no rice, no this, then beating beans, then fish, and all those things. Then after that, is, is that true? It's a fad still. And I'm usually mortified when people say they're not eating because they want to lose weight. Because um, the brain 
the source of energy that your brain understands that it uses for its processes is from carbohydrates. And that should be the majority wow. of what, what we eat. So carbohydrates should be about 45 to 60% of our daily calorie intake. It's like a, a revelation. <laughs> you know, so that's what we cut out in the diet process. Carbohydrates is not the problem. What people need to know is what healthy carbohydrate is. Now I said to my patients, when you think about carbohydrates, you think brown. Usually the white carbohydrates are refined carbohydrates. So there's a lot of sugar, there's a lot of processing. So the good stuff in it, the fiber in it has been taken out such that you're just loading up on sugar. So when you're thinking white bread, you're thinking rice, or white rice and all of that, that's a lot of, you know, bad carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. But carbohydrate in itself is not bad. Just know what the healthy carbohydrate to eat is. Most times when people sit in front of me and I'm like, okay, how do you feel being on? I've had um, clients who have come back to me after keto diet, after Cambridge, after one kind of fast or the other. And, you know, sometimes I'm being very cheeky, but I, say, I, I just say to them, I say, oh, how have you felt lately? You know, and they're like, okay. I said, do you find that you're a bit irritable? <laughs> you are non-attentive? Your creativity has been dampened? And they say, yes. And that's because you're depriving the brain of the mm -hmm. energy that it needs. Wow. That truly is a revelation. Mm -hmm. But another thing that you then said was when, so when you were living in the UK at the time, it was easy to have a structure for exercise. Mm -hmm. So for those who say, okay, fine, we're going to then exercise, you we know, could take long walks and all of those things. Then you move back to Nigeria. In the UK, it was easy. One, a lot of foods, food stuff that you buy already come, you know, clean and everything. So all you just have to do is, okay, go there and cook the food. And then, of course, you had constant electricity, so you could refrigerate whatever you had left over such that I could cook for a week and know that, okay, I just have to reheat and all of that, you know. And then getting back here, sometimes I want to shop and I have to go to like four different locations before I get everything that is on my list. So that was a, a tad frustrating. And I found it a bit hard, you know, getting on the estate and just trying to do a walk and all of that. And then my husband was very particular about security. So he's like, oh no, you can't go out there, you can't, and then we'll just come back and everything, you know. So then when we moved to Yaba, and I thought, okay, maybe I should start. He had the same problem because we lived in a very open part of Yaba and it was like, oh, just off about Macaulay, you know. So he was like, no. Then I decided, okay, Unilag is close by, mm. so and then it's gated and everything. So he allowed me once I decided I was going to. So what can people do when, like you, you know, they truly want a lifestyle that gives them the ability to exercise, to get these things, and the it's just not, there's no conducive environment. So what other ways is that there things they can do? Oh yes, there's a lot of easy things to do. Um, first of all, I want to say categorically, you don't need gym membership to be healthy. You don't need to register no. in a gym. Neither do you need to go and buy all the Adidas and Nike stuff and everything, <laughs> an old t-shirt, old pair of leggings, and old trainers really will, will do the work. You know, and then um, for me, I think my biggest challenge was I'm not an indoor person. So, because I had I actually had exercise DVDs and things, but it was difficult to, to stick with, yes, play. because sometimes I'm like, okay, 15 minutes into it, I'm like, this is not me, because I like the outdoors, I like the, the feel of the wind in my face. Mm. So usually things like, okay, we're brisk walking, you know, that works for me, you're cycling, you're swimming, so you're outdoors, and that was the struggle for me. But eventually, when I saw that there was a lot of stumbling blocks and everything, mm. I actually got around to working out in the house. I mean, it wasn't my favorite thing to do, but I did it. You can do rope jumping, stair climbing, even dance. And the beautiful thing about African music is it's very it's fast very, beats. Yes. And so even, you know, sometimes I just play something for 30 minutes and I just move my body, I sweat it out and, and that's fine. If you have stairs in your house, by all means, you can, you know, do... Um, yes, you can just run back and forth on the stairs. Of course, not at a leisurely pace, because for any exercise that you do, you want to raise up your heart rate mm. so that you begin to burn calories. Rope jumping is very good and um, it, it's a form of exercise called plyometric. So any, ex any form of workout that involves jumping because with that uh, um, you're still burning calories even when you stop because it's a very good way to jumpstart mm. your metabolism. So usually things that involve jumping, they're, they're very good um, activities. So even when you stop, there's still an afterburn. Yes, uh, and then um, just find out what is, is good for you, what you enjoy to do. Because with um, my patients, what I do is, what do you like? What are your hobbies? Then we build your exercise around, around that. that. You know, as simple as gardening is actually exercise. Taking oh. care of pets, yes. Even playing with your children, the 30 minutes mm. that you run around the house, you yes. know. So people think exercise and think, okay, 
a particular look, you have to go to the gym, and so it wears people out. But when you start to look at it as something that can be part of your everyday life, then it becomes easier. And the whole idea is for it to be something that is easy to do so that it's a lifestyle. So I won't go to the gym. I mean, yes, I have gym membership and all of that. I go when I need to go. But I'm not the kind of person that can commit to going to the gym six mm. days a week for the rest of my life. It's not who I am. And there's a lot of people that it's not convenient for. And then the other thing I discovered, a lot of people say that they don't have time. Yes. And one of the things that I, I get clients to do is to develop a value system. Because I realize when people say they don't have time, what they're really saying is it's not important. You have time to go to parties. You have time to go to work. I said to people, you get up first thing in the morning. I do a prayer walk. So I walk for one hour. So I'm walking and I'm praying, and praying. at the same so time. Yes. yes. So you are, yeah, I'm, I'm benefiting in, in two ways. You know, find out what works for you. If it's, you have more time on your hand, leisurely time in the evenings, then you do your workout in the evening. The important thing is that you are getting something done. And then you can also work out at work. Instead of taking the lift, you can use the, the stairs. stairs. And I know a lot of people work in offices where you're, you're on four, five mm -hmm. floors up, you know. So you can also do that. Or you go to the shopping mall, park your car somewhere far so that you then get at least about 10, 15 true. minutes to walk. So there Very are little true. things here and there that we can do. You, you, sit, you sit in the office, you want to talk to the person in the next room, you're calling on the phone. You can actually just get up. <laughs> and go and meet Yes, the you know, that's a habit that my husband has that I had to pick up on. He does it very subconsciously. My husband never sits down to take a phone call, never. So my husband is on the phone, he's walking he's back pacing. and forth. Yes, he's pacing. So uh, that I've taken from him. So when I get on the phone now, I stand up and I just move around because you might be on the phone for five minutes, 10 minutes, and you're burning, you know, the calories. Then another thing I do in church, for a very long time, you know, you are dancing in church, you just stand on one spot and you're moving your body. Now I no, go I back and then of exactly. course I have my activity tracker. So I go back and forth. Sometimes being in church for two hours, I have like 7,000 steps yes. just by, you know, moving forward and backwards, <laughs> doing my dance as opposed to standing like a tree that doesn't move, <laughs> you know. So there's really a lot of things that can be done, easy things Fantastic. that can... Fantastic, and they're very you know, practical yes, things, yes. very practical things. And interestingly, I've never seen this before. You said when you started exercising, you realized you had exercise allergies. Yes. Okay, um, I, I've grown up all my life with um, allergies, and so the, the, it became very difficult for me to eat because I didn't know what I was going to react to and all of that. And then growing up, it wasn't tested such that I knew the particular things that, that there were. So I, I remember at 13 in boarding, I had um, purple one day and I almost died. I had the, 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 wow. the reaction was so instantaneous that I think the blessing was that my school was on the other side of the road from the general hospital because um, everything started to swell. My mm. face was swelling and my lips, I started having hives on my skin. And mm. what had happened was my trachea, that's my airway, mm -hmm. was also swollen. So it had, so the hole there had gone closed. Very small. So, so no there was, air yes, I couldn't. So I, 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 all I remembered was that I was jumping like a headless chicken and nobody understood what was, what was wrong. But somebody wow. had the presence of mind to say, okay, call the house matron and they rushed me to the hospital. And thankfully the doctor who was in the emergency room knew to give me hydrocortisone, and so I was able to overcome that. So yes, for, for, for most of my life, I would usually take um, steroid injections, or I have some antihistamines, so that if I ate anything and mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of what was in it and I had a reaction, I could um, help myself to that. I didn't realize that I was going to have exercise allergy. The first time I actually started working out, I was still in university, and so I would... Um, well, Dal would come and get me from my room. He was my boyfriend at the time. So he would get me from my room and would just, you know. And I realized that I start to run. And then the minute my body begins to warm up, everywhere starts to itch and then it starts to get, you know, red wow. and everything. And I didn't know what it was. And then it would take a while. So I couldn't have a bath. I had to wait for the itching to subside. So I would be late for my first lectures and everything. And I didn't know what it was, of course, until as I advanced in you know, in medical school, and then I realized that there was something called cholinergic urticaria, you know, which is basically your body now releasing substances, you know, and is reacting to it such that, okay, the itching and all of that, the histamines really, they're the ones that will cause the itching and stuff. So my mast cells were releasing histamines that was causing for, for me to itch. So as a rule, I never run. I just brisk walk. And sometimes I actually even itch brisk walking. So anything mm. that, yeah, so I'm very mindful of um, taking on anything that, you know, in terms of food, in terms of exercise. This is quite a body of knowledge. <laughs> Do you know, because some people might exercise and just think, oh, why is my body itching? Why oh, am no, I sweating? No. So 
So they're not, they they're not strange. Yeah, it's, it's exercise allergy. Fantastic. We have to go on a break now. But then when we come back, we're going to talk about wellness. The way you went into wellness opened my eyes entirely. But we'll go on a short break now. Still more on this very interesting topic with Dr. Tony Badiabas when we return. Yeah, welcome back to Chapters. And it's been a very knowledgeable episode talking about healthy living and wellness with Dr. Toyin Body Abbas. Thank you. Thank you for you've, having you've, me. I, I thought when I read the book, it was revelation. Now, talking to you is, is much more. <laughs> but I want us going to wellness. Yes. In fact, the title of the book is Wellness Found Me. And your wellness in this book, this is amazing. Now, I'll define it as you said in the book. You said wellness is a state of being healthy in mind, body, and spirit as a result of deliberate effort. Yes. And I think the key word there is actually being deliberate about it. And um, for a lot of um, people, you look at health in terms of physical. So what pain do you have and everything. But um, it, it, most of the times, symptoms that people have are coming from other aspects of their person, you know. And there's a reason why God created us, spirit, soul, and body. Yes. Now, to be in... A state of health there has to be symphony in all three so you have to mm. be healthy spiritually you have to be healthy in your soul yes, yes. as your mind and you have to be healthy in your body and then um, what, what I seek to do is to help people come to that place where you can harness all, all three of them mm. and actually then be in a place where you are healthy you're well so what I what, what um, I do with my integrative health and wellness is you take a holistic look at a patient so I never look at you as just symptoms and disease. So I want to know what's going on in your spiritual life, intellectually, financially, socially, emotionally, even your environment, you know, all of those things actually have a role to play in your well-being. So when we get to the place where you are able to define the things that are affecting you in other parts of your well-being, then you might be able to say, okay, you now know how to take charge of your health. So you're looking at, okay, what is the state of um, person's, person's life. life. Okay, so how are they in their home? What's going on in their emotional life? Do they have any family troubles? What's going on in with fact, work? Yeah, she reminded me of this. So there's an example in the book of a certain oh, yes. woman. She, 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 had... she came to me. She had been taking blood pressure medication and everything. And so typically I don't prescribe medication. So what okay. I do is, because the way God created the body, he has the innate capacity to self-heal. So what you need to hmm. do is be able to harness spirit, soul, and body to a place of unity, a place of symphony, and then the body starts to heal itself. So typically, I don't, um, I don't, I don't prescribe, prescribe you know. no, you know, because food in itself is medicine, and that's that's the approach that that I take. So she came to me, and um, she had been on blood pressure medication. So we do something called an annual wellness visit, as opposed to your comprehensive medical checkup that you will do. So during the annual wellness visit, we do a health risk assessment. So looking into what your risks are based on the family that you're born into, yes. what your environmental risks are, the risks that are, you know, you're predisposed to because of age and of course genetics. And then there's the aspect of we're then looking at you, the total person. So we go through all eight aspects of your well being and then we start to pick problems. Okay. So typically at the end of that annual wellness visit, we're able to actually find where the mm, problem where is the problem coming, is from. coming from and then we plan an intervention so okay. intervention usually is one to halt the disease pr process and hopefully reverse it and whereby you don't have any disease process already ongoing we prevent okay so yes okay, and so yes. that that's that's the key thing about wellness so you're being proactive rather than reactive. reactive. And that's what conventional medicine does. So you take ill first, then we start to give you pills to try and treat. So why don't we get to the place where we even prevent anything you know, that by might being have. proactive with our nutrition and with our health? Fantastic. So the eight dimensions of wealth, as you mentioned in the book, the spiritual dimension, emotional dimension, physical, financial dimension, intellectual, social dimension, environmental, mm -hmm. and occupational. I, you know, I could have said, okay, spiritual, emotional, physical. You know, when you went into occupational, environmental, social, people don't really realize that all of those things actually affect your Absolutely. wellness. For a lot of people, one of the key problems that they have is work-life balance. Mm -hmm. And that's what is tipping them into so lifestyle the occupational disease. Yes. So how do you then get to the point where you know, okay, this is where the, my own wellness 
um, lag or you know deficiency is coming from? Uh, um, it comes from your annual wellness visits. We look at eight dimensions of wellness, and then we do a health risk assessment. So straight away, like sometimes even before doing the reports, I've done this, you know, so often that by the time I'm having a consultation with you, I already know what the problem is. Wow. You know, I've, I've had a, a patient sit in front of me before. She had seen my husband. My, my husband was like, you know what? I think you need to see my wife. I don't think that you need any pills or anything. Let's, you know. Okay, so to mention, your husband is also a doctor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So she got in front of me, and I saw her the first time. And straight away, I knew what the problem was. But I, I, what I also do is help you to name the problem so that you then know that this is what the problem is. And then also, we, we don't say to you, this is what you should do, this is what you should do, and all of that. Because that's what conventional medicine does. The doctors practice medicine on you. Hmm. With wellness, it's a partnership. So we identify the problems together. We also identify the, the fix together. So once you are the ones bringing up the suggestions of what you think that you need to do, you're more likely to do it than me when I'm exactly. telling you what needs to be done. So usually once you get your reports and everything, we say to you, these are the risks that we identify. Which do you want to deal with first? Because if I think based on being the medical doctor and I'm saying to you, this is what is very urgent that we fix. If you don't see it as your priority, guess what? Mm -hmm. Whatever intervention, it won't be done. Mm -hmm. So usually I get patients to decide what they want us to deal with first. But the beautiful thing about it is whatever it is that they decide, usually the intervention also helps the other things that are actually, because what we deploy is healthful eating. We do physical yes. activity. Like yeah, and then we do... Um, lifestyle adjustment and behavior modification. So usually once we... Modification is work. It, it, it is. So and this brings me back to a uh, beginning conversation where I said that there has to be a shift in your core because you can't change behavior yes. if you're not ready. But the good thing is that um, usually the pathway in the brain where we've learned all the bad habits that we have, it can be eroded in three weeks. And yes, the and then day principle. yes, so that 21 days to erode, another 21 days to learn, mm. such that in 42 days, so that's like six weeks, you're able to actually get rid of a bad habit and introduce a new one if you can stick. Yes, wow, <laughs> that, that, that's just amazing. <laughs> oh, so you take the 21 days to get rid of it, then yes, you have to introduce a new yes. one. What is happening in the brain is that pathway is being eroded, it's being wiped off, mm. then you have to, it lays another pathway for the healthy behavior that you want to. So usually, if people can, I say to people, if you can stick with me for six weeks, then chances are that we've crossed that line where it becomes a struggle. You have, truly speaking, like, this has been a fantastic, fantastic conversation. Thank you. Where can people get copies of All This Family? Um, available at leading bookstores, and okay. it's also on Jumia. What we're trying to do now is also to put it on Amazon so that even people in the diaspora can have access to it. Because um, I find that um, these days I have consultations via Skype and FaceTime from mm -hmm. Canada, tomorrow, from Norway, from yes, because people are looking for more. Most people are tired of being on the pill for whatever ailment for the rest of and their lives. Been on it for years. Yes, because it's it's exhausting. And and what 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 um we usually say in medicine is that all drugs are poisons, even paracetamol. You know, so every drug carries a side effect, which is usually potentiated when you then take, take for, long for long time. periods at a time. And then get so addicted to it. You're then... trying to fix a problem, but ultimately creating another one. So, but we have the luxury of food as medicine, and then add exercise to that, change your behavior, change your lifestyle, and you're on your way to, to being healthy. Thank you. Thank you for being such an educative guest. Thank you for today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Wow, it has been a fantastic episode. And I think one thing that I've taken away is knowledge is power. Ignorance kills. There are things that we've learned today that, you know, we take for granted. We just go on crash diets and all those things that I said. And they are actually doing more harm than good. And I'll read something from the book. She says, wellness is a conscious, self-directed, and evolving process of achieving full potential. Everything we do and every emotion we feel relates to our well-being, and this directly affects our actions and emotions. It is up to us to ensure that everything about our spirit, soul, and body works to full capacity so that our lives can also work to full capacity. Thank you for watching Chapters today. And remember, it is not just about what you know, but what you do with what you know. Until the next episode, thank you and God bless you.